Well, I will go ahead and get us started with our introductions. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Lenny Rose. I'm the events manager here at East City Bookshop. It's wonderful to be with you all today for both in person and for our virtual friends who are tuning into our live stream. Our fall calendar is full of events and we are in full swing after we were closed for a month from our flood. For those of you who don't know, we were closed for a month because of a flood. We're back open. Yay! Um, so we're very thrilled to be back with you all this evening and, uh, all the information about our upcoming events and our 14 different book clubs can be found on our website. Uh, before we get to tonight's event, some housekeeping details. Number one, if you could take a moment to silence your cell phones, we would appreciate it. Uh, number two, if you need a bathroom, it's upstairs past the cash registers and the greeting cards. Number three, we will have time for questions tonight for both in-person and virtual attendees. So even if you're watching via Zoom, you can participate. Please put those questions in the Q&A feature so that we can see them and can ask on your behalf. And finally, most importantly, if you still need to purchase a copy of Women We Buried, Women We Burned, we have copies available upstairs at the register, and they can be purchased prior to the signing line. Uh, and now the reason that we're here tonight. Uh, for decades, journalist Rachel Louise Snyder has been a fierce advocate reporting on the darkest social issues that impact women's lives. Women We Buried, Women We Burned is her own inspiring story. Tomorrow is the 30th anniversary of the Violence Against Women Act, so we're very honored to be hosting Rachel tonight for this timely discussion. Rachel Louise Snyder is the author of Fugitive Denim, the novel What We've Lost is Nothing, and No Visible Bruises, a New York Times Top 10 Book of the Year, winner of the J. Anthony Lucas Work in Progress Award, the Hillman Prize, and the Helen Bernstein Book Award, and finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, LA Times Book Prize, and Kirkus Award. Snyder is a professor of creative writing and journalism at American University, and she lives right here in Washington, D.C., and I'll let her take it away. Am I supposed to um, stand or sit here? Okay. I will sit. Hi, I know so many of you. Um, so it's nice to see uh, all my friends here in the audience. Um, thank you for coming. Gosh, I know so many of you from Cambodia. <laughs> so random. Here we are in Capitol Hill. I'm, I've got my phone, not because I'm going to answer it, although I might answer it. You never know. Could be the president. Could be the future president. Um but because otherwise, like a good salesperson, I can talk and talk and talk, which I get from my father. He was a salesman, and we Snyders are talkers. This is my former student, Quran. I'm a talker, am I not? <laughs> Very diplomatic. Quran, who has two beauty. Is your, is your second book out? Soon. When's it come out? December 1st. Okay. Quran Maddox. M-A-D-H-O-K. Highly recommend. Novel and a nonfiction book. Yay. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, um, I'm here to talk about my memoir, but I also am so keenly aware that we are, those of us who know about domestic violence and work in the domestic violence space are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the violence against women act which um i have a ton of friends at the white house right now i'm super jealous that i did not my invite once have gotten lost in the mail um but that created the space not just for funding for shelters and programs for abuse victims but it also i think spearheaded a national conversation that is ongoing. Um, and certainly for me as a journalist, it's ongoing. Um, if, if any, has anyone read No Visible Bruises? Okay. So there's, um, there's a conversation that No Visible Bruises is having with, that's my third book with this book. Um, this is my memoir and it's not just, um, I mean, there is some violence in here, but it's more about, um, the ways that women are, um, inhibited in their movement around the world. And I, my friend Lisa and I were talking on the way here. Hi, Lisa. Lisa and I who met in Cambodia. Um, and I was saying to her that gl famous Gloria Steinem quote about, we'll know we've achieved equality when women can walk at night. And, um, that's sort of where the title of this book comes from. Um, it's not literally, well, 
actually could be literally in a in a dark and cynical way if you've read the memoir but um so I'm gonna I'm gonna I don't read a whole lot at my readings ironically I I read for a couple minutes and then I chat and then I read a little bit more um and so you know I'll just kind of be up here for maybe 20 minutes and then I'll take questions from either online or um or people sitting right here and thank you all for coming by the way it's harder and harder to find the space for I think getting people interested in the written word and it's um sort of scary to those of us who have tried to carve out a life in this space and so it's really I it's <laughs> more and more an honor when people actually show up and make time and um give you their their attention for a little while so um i'm going to start by reading from the beginning of the book my when i was eight my mother died and um the thing that was shocking about her death was that it my brother and i my brother and i didn't talk about this until many many years later probably 20 years later but we she had been sick she had breast cancer she'd been sick my whole life like she got diagnosed when i was three so i only knew her going in and out of hospitals like making get well cards for her like one of my most vivid memories is the endless endless cards because we were kids we were not allowed to visit her in the hospital so it was like oh she's coming home again you know welcome home you know we just had all these signs and little construction paper pieces of art and so um you know we had the ambulance over at our house frequently we had um you know she was unable to get out of bed um and so when she did eventually die it was shocking because my brother and I just thought she would just be sick forever I was eight he was nine um and so I'm gonna start by reading um uh just a brief section of the day that we that we came home and we lived in Pittsburgh at the time um we lived in uh, a place called Moon Township, which is just such a great fictional name. You guys, somebody can steal that if you want it. I'm never going to use it because it's too on the nose, but um, somebody else might want to use it. Moon Township. So we came home. It was a Friday and um, there's like some seats up here. And since I know you, Dr. Sim, I know. Come, Dr. Sim. In fact, I'm just going to read just over you. I'm just going <laughs> to hover over you. <laughs> By the way, another friend I met in Cambodia. I mean, it's crazy. Hi, Karen Wu. <laughs> um, so it was a Friday afternoon. My brother and I came home from school. And there was an ambulance in the driveway. That the ambulance was parked on this day was new. Usually they had their lights going sirens off, engine running, and they were strapping my mother on a thin gurney. But today it was like they'd stopped in for coffee, hopped in to see how Gail was doing in this split level house, like a regular stop on their route. I wore white jeans with the name Benedict Arnold in bubbly orange letters all over them. It was casual Friday before we had a name for casual Friday. My mother only let me wear pants to school one day a week and never jeans. Benedict Arnold had made the cut because the pants were white and orange and thus did not qualify as jeans, even if they had rivets and pi five pockets and side seams and were made from cotton. An EMT stood in our blue carpeted living room at the bay window where my mother kept alive spider plants and a Christmas cactus and ferns. He nodded when I came up the stairs from the front door landing. A radio crackled at his waist. I went to the large white settee. It was designed by my great-grandmother and given to my parents on their wedding. I shrugged off my book bag, looked down at my white-clad legs for a second or two. Benedict Arnold, Benedict Arnold. Why wasn't the EMT doing anything? Why wasn't he taking her away on a stretcher? I glared at his dark blue back for a minute. The details mattered. Parked ambulance, immobile EMT, not taking her away. I remember him looking out the big picture window with the tangle of plants at his waist. 
In my memory, he has no head, and his radio's crackling fills the house. I ran down the hallway. My mother was propped up on one of those bed rest pillows that look like the sliced off upper half of a barca lounger. She was making a macrame belt, and it splayed unfinished on the bed beside her. Her, middle tank, her metal tank on the floor beside her bed with oxygen tubes snaking around her ears and up her nose. People say children are intuitive, that nothing gets past them. I picked up all the tiny cues this day. Parked ambulance, gathering of relatives, men in blue. But I missed the primary event. The sequence is where I'm unclear. I ran down the hallway... Her, mother, her bedroom door was cracked an inch. She wouldn't have wanted me to look, but I did. Of course I did. One eye peering through the crack. Was this a betrayal or an intimacy? This thievery, this glance. My mother seemed old to me then, 35. It was only the years still to come that brought her youth into sharp focus as I myself aged toward that number. She was old, and then she was young. I was young, and then I was old. But another part of me is frozen forever in 1977. A girl with her young mother. Sometimes I can watch the reel in my mind, and I understand what any viewer would immediately glean. That we lose them both in that moment. The woman and the girl. I read once how trauma freezes a person in time so that a part of them remains tethered to the person they were at the time of the trauma. So somewhere inside me, I am forever eight years old. I can't breathe. I can't breathe, my mother hissed, grasping for air. You could pinpoint the violence of death to this second. I can't breathe. Those were her last words trite, literal, her entire focus bringing into sharp re relief the failure of her autonomic nervous system. The banality of the word, breathe, breath, haunted me. The failure of her own biology was her final tether to this earth. Not her future, not her past, not her husband or her children, not even her own mother on all fours yelling at her to stay in this world. This is what people mean, I think, when they say we die alone. Air, oxygen, breath, and then nothing. Cancer took my mother, but religion would take my life. So, um, my mother, so after my mother died, because her illness was so, I'm going to stand up so you can, hi, Jeannie, hi, Ann. Got so many people I love in this audience. That's so great. I love that the dog's taking up so much space in the comfy couch. That is mad respect from one dog lover to the next. Um, so my mother's illness really had um been this kind of um rhythm in my brother's life and my life. So we would come home from school and it was always like, um, can we play or does she need something? Can we you know, can we walk into the woods, into our fort, which was like two blue chairs in the dirt, um, but we, it was a fort to us. Um, or do we have to like stay with her? Did she need something from us? Um, she was, you know, she was in and out of the hospital all the time, as I mentioned earlier. And she was also like really, really strict. And I was what they called a tomboy in those days. I don't know if you can use that word anymore, but I, you know, I wanted to climb trees and play baseball with Gary Rosa and you know I wanted to do all the things that my brother got to do that my mother thought was not proper because she was a sort of proper Jewish woman from Boston and you know wanted to dress me in frilly clothes all the time and so when she died um my brother and I had this like total wild run of the neighborhood like we were just um kids with no rules at all and it was wonderful like we would go up to the cul-de-sac and play kickball all day. And I never realized how much we shared this like two year period, um, how much we both 
really relished that freedom. It was kind of surprising to me that my brother and I, you know, when I wrote the book, I gave it to him because I, you know, you have to do that kind of thing. And so we were able to, for the first time, talk about a lot of things that we shared. And one of them was this like weird guilt that we both felt about having so much freedom to really eat what we wanted, go where we wanted. I think because my mother was sick, she made us eat all kinds of like crazy stuff. She has drinking like warm water with lemon every day to clean out our systems. I'm like, I'm six. Like how bad could things be in there? You know? Um, and you know, it's just like, so then suddenly we're like, no, but now I could eat apple jacks. Like it just was, um, it was sort of funny. And we had women who would come in, like my grandmother would come in and try and like take care of us, but everybody treated us like kids who had lost their mother. And we were aware of it. You know, we were like, but my mom died, I get some chocolate, you know, and then we would get chocolate and um, it kind of, it worked. I still use that occasionally. Hi, Sonia. Hi. Um, but my father, and it took me writing this book to really think this through. Um, my father, I think for all the freedom that my brother and I felt, my father must have felt the exact opposite he must have felt like it's 1978 America or 1979 suburban America. I cannot be a single dad. I'm not doing right by my kids by not providing them a mother. And I didn't, my dad died at the start of COVID. So I, I wish I could have asked him this actually, um, because he made a series of what I would call really questionable decisions um, about a year and a half into this the halcyon days. Um, and one of them involved, he met a woman at a family camp in Illinois that was put on by my uh, uh, aunt and uncle who were very religious, like evangelical, super strict, the kind of health and wealth, prosperity gospel. Does anybody remember Jimmy Swaggart or, you know, like who was the crazy guy? Bob, not Bob Jones. That's a university um no he was he came he's later huh who's the kool-aid guy bob jones no no i'm thinking of um oral roberts oral roberts yeah yeah um so these people were like you know to my father they were um aspirational and so we go to this summer camp he meets this woman she has two kids the same age as basically the same age as my brother and i and um, we get home from that week long summer camp and he announces that we're moving to Illinois. He doesn't, by the way, tell me that he's getting married to this woman that he's known for seven days. <laughs> but he says we're moving. And my brother and I moved two weeks later. And I remember like I was like, I'll take over the paper route. I'll live here by myself. I'll do it. like I was convinced at 11 that I was perfectly independent and didn't need him. And probably I would have been fine, actually. Maybe not. But we moved two weeks after we got home from camp, family camp. And then um, we went to a Christian, like an evangelical school that my aunt and uncle started that had 48 kids, K through 12. Huxley, do you remember how many kids were in my eighth grade class? I've told you this before. You can count them on one hand. Five. That includes me, by the way. I was 20% of the class. Um, and my mother, my real mother was Jewish. So it wasn't just, oh my gosh, we moved to a new state um, with like new people. But we also like suddenly had all the Judaism that we had grown up with was just like excised from our life. And we were now evangelical and um, about two weeks after we moved, two or three weeks after we moved, I was, we were living with my aunt and uncle and my father, like got the house in Pittsburgh ready to sell. And I thought it was, I was in, I was heavy in my eavesdropping period. I don't know if anyone else went through an eavesdropping period, but you know, you'd pick up the phone, our landlines, and you remember you'd like hit the the little thing and then just gently lift it up. So that's what my cousin and I did. And we're like, <laughs> and we hear my aunt say, well, Dick's moving here to marry Barb. And there's only so many people that could be referring to. And I um, 
dropped the receiver and ran. Like I just ran barefoot out of the house. I was like, he didn't even tell us. Like he didn't tell us that he was getting married. And um, so that didn't go well. And uh, if you look at, I have like, I have their wedding album and I'm just sobbing in every picture. I'm just red faced. I'm crying so hard. My brother actually still remembers like the sound of me sobbing in the sanctuary of this big giant church and nobody intervenes. Like nobody says, slow your roll a little bit here, Dick Snyder. Like no one does that. And so my brother's response to all of this, this all happened in two months. He married her in October of, we had met, he had met her in August, married her in October. Oh, and by the way, just to add <laughs> Just to add to like the decision, the excellent decision making, they then went on a honeymoon for guess how long? A month. Who takes a month long honeymoon? People who are trying to speak, escape their prepubescent teenagers, I think. But so he, they take a month long honeymoon and they go, they're religious. So where do you think they go? The Holy Land. Yes, they go to the Wailing Wall, they go to Jesus's grave and stuff. It's, it's all like kind of funny now, but it didn't seem so funny at the time. So my brother's response to this is to buy into all of the religion and everything. My response is to rebel immediately in every way that I can. And, um, you know, I'm a parent now, and one of the things that I that I've talked to so many other parents about. I know there's a bunch of parents here, a bunch of my friends here. Hi, Dr. Sim. I never call her that, just, you know. Um, but I know that a lot of us have this experience where we have a child and then suddenly we understand our parents and we empathize with them in a way that we never have before. And I remember when I gave birth and I was holding my daughter, um, you know, for the very first time and I was looking at her and I went, oh, fuck, no, I did have some shitty-ass parenting. Like, that was really shitty. Like, I really had this, like, moment where I realized, oh, what I suspected was crappy parenting all along, in fact, was crappy parenting. So um, so I rebelled in big ways and small ways. I started smoking. I got kicked off the pep squad. Actually, I'm sorry, it's even worse than that. I got the pep squad disbanded because I introduced them all to smoking. Um, yeah. And I was definitely the ringleader. Um, and then, you know, one thing led to another, there were, I can say this, even though my dear, my dear goddaughter Huxley is 15, but she knows this all about me. And if not, sorry, no kidding. Um, you know, I started to do a lot of drugs and, um, I just had no boundaries in the way that as James Baldwin would say, the most dangerous creation of any society is the man who has nothing to lose. And although I didn't have the articulation yet, that is most definitely how I felt when I was 14, 15 years old. And um, so let's see what else. I was going to read like a few. Yeah. So um, let me check the time. Okay. Well, I don't know. My phone shut down. So I have no, now it's like I'm in Vegas and I have no idea what time. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm getting the thumbs up. Okay. Um, so from fifth to eighth grade, I went to this, um, religious school with 48 kids, um, that my aunt and uncle, uh, had created. Um, by the way, I just have to say one thing about this school. We worked in little cubicles, not cubes, like office cubes, but cubes that were like the size of the chairs with like horse, you know, like blinders. Yeah. So you couldn't see the person next to you, but you could like tap their foot. And we worked in these little booklets in like math, English, social studies, science, and Bible. Well, I'm, I mean, you could take Old or New Testament. Um, and uh, if you had a question, you we didn't actually have like a teacher teaching. You would just teach yourself in these booklets. If you had a question, you had to raise a flag in a tiny hole at the top of your... And then your the teacher, i.e. my aunt, would come over and like whisper, whisper, whisper the answer, whatever. Um, so that was how we taught ourselves. And in in one way, it was great because you could work really far ahead. In another way, it was terrible because if you were not good at something like I am terrible at math, you would fall 
horribly, horribly behind. And my daughter, who is 16 now, she lapped me in math probably by fifth grade. Like, no exaggeration. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure I call your husband whenever I have a math problem. <laughs> so the school disbanded after my eighth grade year. Um, my stepsister, hair, my stepsister graduated from high school. My brother was a year older than me. My stepbrother was a year older than me. And so they, they finished ninth grade at that school. And then we all got shipped to the public school. And this was a, a very urban, very big, like 2,500 kids public school. And I was, you know, I had had five in my graduating class for the last four years or in my class for the last four years. So I was like, just instantly overwhelmed. And I found my people in the smoking lounge. Remember the eighties? We could smoke in high school. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> so, and then, you know, they introduced me to all kinds of other things and by the end of my sophomore year, um, I was invited to leave and not return. <laughs> and so, um, so I was kicked out of school and my stepsister had graduated and was like, I think she was in beauty school or something. Um, and then there were my, was my stepbrother and my real brother. And we were all imploding in our own ways there was a lot of violence in the house and so one day in September of 1985 my parents sat us down the four of us gave us each a typed up sheet of paper with a list of rules which I almost brought tonight and then forgot because I still have it at home and basically said if you don't follow these rules you are um, not gonna live in our house and that was a, it was a Saturday morning and the four of us scattered and never went home again. Um, so I'm going to just read a tiny little section of that. Polly is my, uh, the name I've given to my stepsister here. It's not her real name. Um, and Aaron is the name I've given to my stepbrother. When Holly and I returned to our house on that Sunday morning, so just a quick primer Holly and I had were friends with two other sisters an older and a younger sister like up the street and we just went to their house the two of us when Holly and I returned to our house the next morning the front door was unlocked we let ourselves in and nearly tripped over four empty suitcases lined up in the entryway my father and stepmother stood at the top of the stairs watching us their faces stern pick one my dad told me he was not interested in hearing more, in talking to me at all. The mirrored wallpaper of the hallway offered fuzzy outlines of the scene. The shag-carpeted stairs, the railing slats, the four suitcases. I froze there for a long moment, my brain refusing to take in what I was seeing. The suitcases, the stiff line of my father's face. Leave, I finally understood. Leave this house and don't return. I could feel nausea threatening to erupt in my stomach, a chill starting at my fingertips and working its way into my body. Holly was 20. Aaron was 17. The two of them went to their grandmother's house in a suburb a half hour to the west. David, my real brother, stayed with a friend for a month, and then he rented a room at the YMCA downtown where he could finish his last year of high school. But the equation, four kids, four suitcases, was an abyss for me, like staring into a lightless cave. I could not imagine any future life for myself at all. I picked the most colorful suitcase, a dark blue and maroon soft-bodied Samsonite. I discovered on my very first day gone that if you're going to be unhoused, perhaps the very best place to work is at a restaurant. I never went hungry. If it were up to me, I'd have worked all through the night to avoid the despair that came to me at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. Before the day we were kicked out, I might have had options. I could have gone to an alternative school somewhere. I'd have to start from the beginning pass all the classes I'd failed. I'd be in high school till I was 20 or 21. But that option disappeared the minute I packed my Samsonite. 
I never deceived myself into thinking that I was innocent. Sneaking out of the house all those nights had been a choice. Dissolving a hit of window pane on my tongue was a choice. Sleeping through classes, skipping school, blowing off homework, all of them had been choices I'd made. I was consumed with the knowledge that I had to develop some kind of plan for myself immediately. Winter was coming. I needed a way to get around besides my own two feet. Sometimes my father had driven me to work if it was raining or if the weather was bad. Perhaps it's strange to consider that my father kicked me out, but then also helped me occasionally once I was out there in the world. Even in those first few weeks, he'd slip a 10 or $20 bill into my palm when he saw me. He'd ask if I was hungry. He must have been terrified of what might happen to me. I believe he was as lost as I was. He didn't know how to control me. Even I didn't know how to control me. He was prepared for none of what had come at him. All of these children, four of the six were brand new. He and my stepmother had two kids after they got married because the chaos wasn't enough for them. <laughs> what do you do with a child who looks you in the eye and says simply, no? A child who doesn't want your indoctrination, your protection, your control, or maybe worse, sees you as the thing from which she needs protection. So um, just a few more minutes and then we'll open up to questions. I ended up, um, you see this in the book, but I end up um, booking rock and roll bands. By the way, do you all know that John Bon Jovi saved somebody on a bridge in Nashville yesterday? Come on. He's not just cute and talented smart, wealthy. He also saves people from bridges. Like that guy's going to have some good karma in his next life. Anyway, he was my heartthrob when I was young. Um, so I booked rock and roll bands and I, uh, met a producer of a rock and roll band who is today Stevie Nicks producer, actually pretty, pretty still big time producer. And he taught me so much about booking rock and roll bands. His name is Frank Papillardo. And he was just wonderful. And he said to me one day, this is maybe after I knew him for six months or so. And he said to me, you know, you got to go to college. You don't want to be a loser for your whole life. And I, I was like, I'm a loser. Like I didn't, it didn't occur to me that I was a loser. I was 19 by then. Um, and he actually convinced me to try. And again, I had no high school diploma. I actually have, for anyone who's interested, I have my um, my high school transcript on my phone. I showed it to you a couple of weekends ago. She, This is a Stanford-educated doctor. She's like, why am I friends with you? She didn't say that. You thought it, though, didn't you? <laughs> anyway, I had a 0 0.467 GPA, which, as I said to the principal, you know, you got to work pretty hard to get that low of a GPA. Like, that's not nothing. Come on. Um, but I was accepted somewhere. Um, I was given the biggest second chance of my life. I've written about that, uh, for the New York times. Um, I've written about it a lot actually. And I write about how that came about in here. And when I was in college, I did a program called semester at sea where you go around the world on a ship. And I had never like I had barely left Illinois. I'd gone to Disney world once where I threw up after the teacups we went to Wisconsin sometimes, but we, oh, and I, we would drive back and forth to Pittsburgh, but that was like the extent of my traveling. And suddenly I go to semester at sea and my very first night outside of America is in a typhoon in Japan, in Kobe. And I'm like, you know, just crazy. But I end up um, just making travel the foundation of my life. And um, I spend the next, I don't know, seven, eight years, nine years traveling. And I eventually moved to Cambodia, where I lived for six years, which is why I keep saying I know all these people in the audience from Cambodia. I'd say one, two, three, I know from Cambodia. And then there's a few more who have been to Cambodia with me. And so Cambodia plays a huge part in my life and in my formation as a as a person. And I just want to read one small 
little couple of paragraphs. Um, I had been living in Cambodia for probably four years at this point. And um, I don't think you need to know anything in particular uh, about this moment, except maybe that I live three doors down from an alligator farm. I don't know, maybe. Um, so I'm just going to read this, and this, I think, speaks to the first part I read. The light in my apartment washes to an intense yellow, a pre-monsoon rain where the atmosphere takes on a mustard hue. It's like no light I've ever seen anywhere else in the world. My apartment is perpetually covered in a thin layer of red dust from the unpaved road outside. A for sale sign appeared on the gate of the alligator farm a week earlier. I popped in once to see the sweeping dirt courtyard, the dusty palms in red clay pots and concrete troughs with white peeling paint. Five alligators, babies, I think. Many Cambodian fables begin or end with various creatures outsmarted by alligators. They are revered because they can live both on land and in water, and because they have only one predator, humans. In the warm afternoon, I sense that I am not alone. Sense is not a strong enough word. I know it as surely as I know the shape of my own body. There's a presence in the room that I can't see with my eyes, but is nevertheless as real as the passion fruit vines growing outside my living room door. I know this presence, fully without a hint of doubt. Had she come to me earlier, when I lived in Chicago, I would have been fearful. I would have turned on every light in my house, played my stereo full blast, called someone, probably even fled. Has Had this presence come even in the first months after I moved to Cambodia, I wouldn't have believed it. But I've been here for years now. I've heard the stories. So when she comes to me, I know it's her. And I sit down on the couch in my living room. I see her. I feel her. I have questions for her. I'd know her anywhere, even these decades later, because it is my mother. Oh, I've never read that out loud. <laughs> um, so my mother visited me in Cambodia, and I believed it then I believe it still and in that scene I ask her a question and she gives me a deeply disappointing answer which is another reason I know it's her because now that I'm a mother I know that sometimes you have to say the thing you don't want to say even if it's the truth to your kid so um thank you all I think we'll open it up to questions now and um yeah. So anyone? Yes. Hi, Wynn. Yes. So the the question was, um, you know, how did I come to accept my father and stepmother in my life? Um, and that's a, that's a question I've been asked a lot, and people have often phrased it as, "How did you come to forgive them?" And I'm not sure that I would term it forgiveness. One of the things that I, one of the big epiphanies that I had living in Cambodia for six years is um, that there are just things in the world we don't understand. We don't, <laughs> you know, the, the Cambodians would tell you though there's a whole world of the spirits that kind of live right alongside our world. Am I correct in that? There's, my friend Lisa has lived there for, lived there for 17 years or something like that. 27 years? I don't know, a long time. Um, and I don't understand that world, um, but I was open to that world, which I think is why my mother could come to me. Um, my father 
had a very different sense of spirituality, but it was no less important to him. Uh, and so what I would say is that I came to think he is limited. I'm limited. We're all limited. And I'm going to find what I can because, you know, yeah, he made really bad decisions. He was also the best storyteller I know. He was um, unfailingly generous. He was hilarious. I get my sense of humor entirely from him. Um, and I also decided once I had a kid that I was not going to carry on the generational trauma. <laughs> what I had endured in my life was for me to bear and not her. And if she wanted to have a relationship with him or separate from him, that would be up to her. And so she did know her, her grandfather. And um, I just made it a conscious point. But I also have what I consider intentional family. You know, Solak is my sister. And my friend Annie back there, hey, Annie. You know, you'll see pictures in the book, and they're both pictured in the book. You're in the book, Huxley here, and sit next to the dog, dog lover, extraordinaire. Um, and so that's my family. That's how I always saw my family, those people. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's a good question. So, yeah. So the question is, um, did I, he, yes, he did die at the start of COVID um, pretty suddenly, actually. I was just saying, I had a whole TV crew in my house and I get this phone call that he's dead. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, did I have an opportunity to ask him questions? Um, did we talk about it? You know, so there's a whole, I don't want to give away the ending, but there is, my stepmother comes to play a huge part later in my life. Um, also I gave birth to my daughter in Bangkok, so I wasn't living in America. So it took a little while before, you know, we got back to the States and, you know, introduced him, <laughs> him to her and all that stuff. So I didn't have to make those decisions immediately. I had the benefit of time, like living in Phnom Penh with the baby and stuff. Um, but the few times I tried to talk to him about it, it was very clear that he felt like the four of us had moved out of our own accord because we refused to live by those rules. And when I would say to him, yes, but I was 16 and you were 40, whatever you were, um, he would say, well, you could have come home anytime. You just had to, you know, accept Jesus and go to church and live by our rules. And so I I didn't broach that with him too many times because that was not going to be a conversation that I was ever going to find closure on. Like, we just sometimes have to live in the uncomfortable space of, of you know, uncertainty. But I will say the, the Christmas, the last Christmas I had with him, um, we went out to brunch. My birthday is the day after Christmas. So we went out to brunch like this was actually probably the first Christmas I'd spent with him in 20 years. And we were in Pittsburgh crazily enough. And we went out to brunch, just the two of us. And he said to me, um, he said, you know, I think you could probably accuse me of um, favoritism of Barb's children, because I was very afraid that I would be accused of having you and David as favorites. And so I overcompensated. And that is as close as I ever got to him taking any responsibility. Um, 
I did enjoy, though, needling. In the last few years of his life, he would come to D.C. and visit me, and we all get together on Friday nights and, like, drink and eat. She cooks for us. She just cooks amazing food. Um, and he would come with me. when, And so we're all, like, you know, these raging liberals, which in my family is, like, such a mark of shame. For I mean, I love it, but they're, you know, they're like, where did we go wrong? And I loved hearing my dad say, like, but aren't the welfare mothers really taking advantage? And then my friend, who's the deputy inspector general of HHS, would be like, let me give you the reports. Like, let me give you the numbers. I did enjoy that in the la the latter years of his life. Um, Yeah, I just loved him for his jokes, you know. I'll tell you one quick story, one 30-second story. Um, so my stepmother died in 2017, and... um. The day after she died, he lived in Arizona. They lived in Arizona by then. The day after she died, um, my father and I were going to the Super Walmart, <laughs> which was like the thing we did all the time. And um, we walk in. You know how Walmart has those greeters? And the greet, you know, like I'm waiting for the greeter to be like, hello, welcome to Walmart. And she says nothing. And so we're we're walking. We're about 10 or 15 feet in. And I turn to my dad because I'm going to make a joke. Like, you got one job right and she can't do the one job and I turn and he's just gone and I'm like where did he go and I turn around and he's back by the entrance entryway and he and the greeter are in an embrace and he is just sobbing on her shoulder and I thought oh that's why because of course he knows her and he has talked to her and she has just said how's your wife and he has just said she she didn't make it she died yesterday and I thought, well, that's who my dad is, actually. Yeah. That story's not in the book. Any Are there any questions online? Mm. Of all my books I've written, which is my favorite and which am I most proud of? Um... I wish my daughter was here, but it's back to school night. So I blowing off her back to school to be here. And she would tell you, cause she's heard me say this so many times. So my first book is a piece of shit that I don't talk about ever. Like truly. And I'm not, I don't even say that in humility. Like it's just really, I, you've heard me say this. I hate that book. Um, my second book is a mem is a no, it's a novel called what we've lost is nothing. And the writing between those books is palpably different. Like it's a much better book. My third book, no visible bruises, the writing is even better. Um, and the fourth, my fourth book, which is women we buried women we burned is I think the best writing I've ever done. So from a purely like artistic craft standpoint, I feel as a writer that I am, um, every book is getting better. Um, in terms of the impact, No Visible Bruises, the third, my third book has just had a huge impact. Um, you know, it's been, it's been used by police departments to, um, like redo the systems with which they treat, um, uh, victims of domestic violence. It's been like community reads in like six states. It's been translated into 30 languages, um, but I, I feel most emotionally connected to this, this book. And so if people are like, I can only buy one book, I'm going to be like, buy this one, buy this one. Yeah. You're a writer. Do you feel like your second book is better writing than your first book? Yeah. I just put my, my former student Quran on the spot and yes, hopefully, yeah. Hopefully your second book is better writing than your first, first. Yeah. Oh yeah, I don't I can. Cause see, that's why I only had one kid. <laughs> uh yeah. Well, let's have one question here and then we'll go back to. Yeah. 
I know. I'm also, I'm teaching at a, at Stanford law school in the winter. I'm like, you know, I'm not a lawyer, right? No, they totally know that. Um, so that's going to be interesting. So the question is, um, you know, this, this sort of waning, uh, attention that we have to the written word and, you know, how that makes me feel, what I think about that. I, I mean, it's terrifying to me. I have, you know, one of my dearest brother from another mother friends is a writer named Andre Debus the third, who you might know if you saw house of sand and fog and he has written, you know, seven or eight just extraordinarily beautiful books, but he's not on social media. And we've had many conversations about, does that hurt your career? What are the ways that it hurts your career? And, um, you know, I'm in the middle of, I, oh, I'm not supposed to talk about this. Oh, fuck it. I'm uh, one of the writers who is suing AI. Um, so you could just search for me and find the, um, because I feel like we have to do whatever we can to protect this incredibly human art form. And I, you know, I often think like, you know, we just had September 11th yesterday, right? I, I, you know, I'm old enough to remember exactly where I was September 11th. You know, I was running, I was living in London, running by the river. Um, and one of the stories I, I like to tell is that after September 11th, two weeks later, you know, all those kids, all there were all a bunch of like schools down in that area, right? People live there. And so those kids had to go back to school. They couldn't stay out of school forever, but they'd been through this incredible traumatic event, right? They'd seen the towers come down. Many of them had lost family or friends or even parents. And so when the schools reopened two weeks later, they were like, what are we going to, what are we going to do? We can't just be like, now two plus two equals four kids, right? And so for that whole first week, they had the kids drawing, painting, and writing their memories of September 11th. And I think that's what we lose when we when we lose humanities right we lose the most important thing the one thing that we go to you know when we when we are overwhelmed by war or politics or hunger or poverty or any of these things i feel like the only way we can we can process that as human beings when we're witness to it is to go to the humanities. It's the only way to make sense of it. Um, I have noticed in my own student work, you know, I teach mostly graduate classes and the students would turn in 10, 12 page essays. Now they're turning in six page essays, graduate students. So um, it does feel a little like I'm, you know, trying to put a teaspoon back in the ocean a little bit, but um you know, that's, I don't know, that's a really hopeless answer, but it is, does fill me with despair, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. What are some of the most moving or meaningful reactions of readers to my books? Um, I have a, I have lots and lots of letters. Um, I have, um, I mean, people really tell me their domestic violence stories a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, I have a lot of letters from incarcerated women. I actually just, um, I'm writing for the New York Times now and I'm writing about gender-based violence and, um, you know, I get just a ton of stuff from from that as well. Um, but I think, yeah, you know, I had a woman come up to me in Chicago. I was doing a reading in Chicago and she had just lost her daughter four months earlier to a domestic violence homicide. And, you know, I just, I just remember being like, I don't know how to, like, all I could do is give her a hug. Like, that's all I could do. There's no words. There's nothing I can say. Um, I had a woman stand up in a ballroom in Atlanta. I was giving a talk once and she said, I can't go home. What should I do? And I was like, um, <laughs> You know, I'm in a room of 200 people. I bet there are people who work in this space who right now can stand up and go and help you. And that's what I did. And this crowd of like a half a dozen people went over and and helped her. But um, I think the people who survive are the ones I've that some of those stories really stay with me. Yes. Hi. Hi, Robin.
Thank you for that. That's so this is Robin. Um, I should say this is my friend Alicia and our kids are dating. And then this is the other mom and their kids are also dating. And if the kids ever break up, the moms are all still just going to hang out. Yeah, we're never breaking up. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. So Crystal Kaiser, for those of you who maybe didn't read the, the column, is a woman in a young woman in Wisconsin who was trafficked at the age of 16. And when she was 17, she killed her abuser and um, has just been sentenced to 11 years in prison. And yeah, I met Robin a couple, maybe a month or two ago, and then she quoted me back to myself. And I was like, she's like, you know, as the author said, I'm like, you know, I'm the author. <laughs> and she didn't know. She didn't know as the author. I was like, this is the best day of my life. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's my favorite story. <laughs> Thank you. Someone's got it. I mean, there's just, it's stunning how much the law is, um, uh, has this sort of frame of patriarchy so much that we don't even notice it anymore. It's just, it's like, this is the reason I'm going out to Stanford actually is to co-teach. I'm not, you know, doing it on my own, um, but to co-teach about gender-based violence in the law and try and figure out if we can do better, honestly. Um, do we, maybe one more question or no more questions? I can share the question I asked my mom in Cambodia, but I kind of don't want to because I kind of want you to read it. It's in the book. It's totally in the book. Um, but it was, yeah, it was a profound question. So I'm not going to give it away. I'm also really bad at keeping secrets. So this is a real, I've turned a real corner here. Thank you. Thank you, Huxley. I appreciate the support. Um, yeah. Jeannie. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, why Cambodia? Um, so I was living in Chicago and I just, I felt like, so my friend Anne back there, who's the wave, I'm, oh, we were, Anne was the photographer and I was the writer and we were traveling the world doing all of these stories. We have some crazy stories, um, which should be another book someday. Um, we're like 11 years of travels relegated to like three paragraphs in the book. Um, but so many of them involve like vomit or nakedness. I don't know, might not sustain a whole narrative, but, um, and we had been to Cambodia in 96 or 95. I forget it's right in the mid nineties when it was still very, um, it was under martial law when we were there. And the, the only reason we went, we actually went to Vietnam for a month and then we had an extra week and we were trying to decide between Laos and Cambodia and, Laos you needed a visa for in Cambodia you could a visa on arrival that's the only reason we ended up there and I felt palpably afraid to be there the thing about Ann and I is that she is physically fearless and I am physically afraid all the time like I I have to force myself to get on step ladders even I'm so scared of heights but I am fearless when it comes to like I don't know living broke or not having a, a, you know, not knowing where my life is going to go or whatever. And whereas that's her sort of like where she, so we're a good, we're a good yin and yang for each other. So we went to Cambodia and I felt braver with her beside me as I do generally in my life. Anyway, I love you, baby. Um, and it stayed with me. I had visited Tool Slang Genocide Museum where 17 to 20,000 people had been killed during the Khmer Rouge um, uh, genocide. And so, so that was whatever it was, 95, 96. And I um, came back to, to Chicago and we just kept doing these like a month away or two months away. And it began to feel like I was having the same experience, like in a different setting. Like, oh, okay, now I'm in Tibet. Oh, okay, now I'm in Guatemala. Okay, now I'm in, and I wanted to go deeper. And so uh, at the time, 2002, it was, I think, or three, I was like considering Venezuela because Venezuela was imploding. I was considering Paris because you just always have to consider Paris. 
Um, and I was considering Cambodia because they had announced that the war crimes tribunals were going to start. It took another like how many years, 10 years or 12 years or something for them to start. But so I was thinking of all three places and Cambodia seemed sort of the meatiest and Asia in general has just always like it's the place in the world that I'm most attracted to. I don't can't explain it. It's just the people the aesthetic the spirituality the you know so I moved in 2003 and I planned to stay there for um a year if I hated it and two years if I loved it but then I published a book and I published a baby and I got married and I ended up staying for six I met you yay so that's why okay well I'm gonna sign if anybody wants to me a signed copy of the book revise that sense. I want to thank you all for, for supporting the arts and supporting writing. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Uh, give us just a moment to reset the space. If you are willing and able to set your chair to the side, uh, we would appreciate that. We have books for sale upstairs. Thank you to our virtual audience for joining us as well. And another round of applause for Rachel. Thank you.